Well, hey there. It's my nerd world. Welcome to it. I'm your host, John Justice, a Star Wars podcast. Took a week off. I'll explain in just a moment. We're going to get a little personal on the show today. Again, I'll explain coming up in a bit. But on the show today, we do have a little bit of news to talk about. The future of Star Wars for now is on TV, with The Mandalorian being the most in-demand streaming show. Some fun speculation about the future Star Wars projects. A personal story of mine, and we're going to talk about the tales of loss in Star Wars and the important role that Loss has played throughout all of the Star Wars storytelling. And then we'll get to some listener feedback this week. I'm really glad you're with the show. I hope wherever you are, you are healthy and you are safe. My Nerd World is brought to you by My Nerd World and MyNerdWorld.net, and more specifically, the Embark Space Opera Science Fiction Series, available at Amazon.com. Just search for Embark, John J-O-N, Justice, or go to MyNerdWorld.net. I have a new blog. I'll talk a little bit about that. And more details about Embark much later in the show. But for now, let's go ahead and get to it. It's an instinct. (laughs) Feeling. The force brought us together. We're not alone. Good people will fight if we lead them. People keep telling me they know me. No one does. But I do. Long have I waited. And now... Coming together. Is your undoing. Confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. Your destiny. got a list of things that I would ask both J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson. And it's a good list. It's not a bad list. I, I love their I love their films. But I do have a running list if I ever had the opportunity to speak to any of them. One of the things I would ask J.J. Abrams is the context of the of the Palpatine line in the trailer where he says, and now your coming together will be your undoing. I like. I know that that was probably going to happen at the end, and I know it was probably going to be in relation to the dyad and going back and looking at some of the leaks and the way that those leaks were actually accurate and how the storyline changed. It's pretty clear that individuals who are on Reddit and and know about you know Jedi Paxis know that those leaks were all correct, and so therefore the changes of those leaks must have been correct as well. That there was there was some some shifting of how that dyad was supposed to play out between Kylo Ren and Rey. So again, I imagine that um, perhaps Palpatine was in a in one iteration of the film was aware of the dyad and intentionally brought Kylo Ren and Rey together to get the energy. That's my guess. And so that line was more like, yeah, man, I set you both up to get your power as the dyad, whereas the way the film played out was more along the lines of Palpatine was more focused on Rey to bring her in to put her on the throne and only through happenstance discovered the power of the two of them being a dyad and the force that brought him back from his decrepit state. But I would ask J.J. Abrams you know why that was in the trailer and what changed because that must have been late in the process. Now it can also be that that was just a really good line, and it did give you as a you know as a viewer sort of a little bit of a hint of where the story was going and maybe the storyline had already changed by then because you know they often put in stuff in trailers that aren't in the movies. Now Star Wars has been pretty good about it. There's only a couple of shots. 
Um, apart from the Rogue One trailer, don't misunderstand. The Rogue One trailer was was what seventy percent of the trailer for the main trailer for Rogue One wasn't even in the film. Um, there was only a few shots that I remember um, from the from the three trailers that weren't actually in the film. That line wasn't obviously, but then there was also uh, a moment in the Force Awakens trailer where Ray is actually looking at some of those food packs that she gets from Uncar Plutt. That was pulled. And I remember that specifically because I had mistakenly thought that she was looking at some type of kyber crystal. There's like an up-close shot in the main trailer. Um, anyways, welcome to the show this week. I'm glad you're with the show. I took a week off uh, last week. Uh, wasn't really planning on it. Uh, there wasn't a lot of news going on, and the weekend got busy. And so I decided, well, um, I'm working on a couple of projects. I'll talk about that at the end of the show. And I decided to go ahead and take a week off. And you're getting this week's show, obviously, early. And um, I'll talk more about that later in the show. I have a bit of a personal story to share that um, I've been kind of public about, but I haven't really gotten into it. And I'm, I'm going to get into it a bit on the show today. And it's the reason why I'm recording the show early. Um, that personal story uh, won't be long, but I'm going to um, use what's happening to me in my, li my, my life right now to talk a little bit more uh, in depth about the films and more specifically the role that loss plays in Star Wars. And that's a topic that we haven't covered on the show in all the many hundreds of episodes that we've done. So um, I'll be doing that again a little bit later on before we get to listener feedback. But with that being said, we do have a little bit of news to share and some fun um, speculation to get to. So without any um, further ado, let's get to it. This is not going to go the way you think. Well, I think for Disney and for Lucasfilm, they were hoping it was going to go this way, and it went better than they probably imagined. I have a story here from Hollywood Reporter, and it goes like this. Over the last nine months, four new streaming services have flooded the market with new original programming. But a new report finds that Disney Plus and the drama The Mandalorian generated the most demand of the new platforms. Third-party measurement from Parrot Analytics has compared the launch weeks of Apple TV, uh, Disney+, Plus, uh, HBO Max, and Peacock, looking at how demand for their original shows stacks up against average demand for U.S. TV shows during that period of time. Uh, the company found that The Mandalorian was far and away the most anticipated of all streaming shows. I'm going to add a little nugget in here before I forget, but the individual who scores the Mandalorian um, has made a comment recently saying that he was really surprised at where Jon Favreau was taking the second season. And I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up because I have a sneaking suspicion that Jon Favreau is going to potentially be following the model of the films in the making of the Mandalorian series and specifically a new hope, the empire strikes back and return to the Jedi. Speaking of Jon Favreau, getting back to the article, his drama, which is set in the world of Star Wars, in case you didn't know, uh, has was made available on Disney Plus November 12th launch day. Demand for the show was more than 55 times higher than the average TV series during the same week. The Mandalorian is in a class of its own, said Alejandro Rojas, the director of Applied Analytics at Parrot. Disney has not said how many viewers The Mandalorian received, but the service did attract 10 million signups. In its first 24 hours, it now has over 60 million global subscribers. Apple TV Plus, which launched a few days earlier on November 1st, had three shows that surpassed demand for the average TV series during that period. They were For All Mankind, Dickens, uh, Dickinson, and C, the morning show, the Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston drama that received significant marketing support, fell slightly below average. At HBO Max, meanwhile, Looney Tunes cartoons was the most in demand. The reboot of the classic series was debuted on HBO's Max um, May 27th launch date was significantly more in demand than Anna Kendrick, uh, Star, Love Life, or the short form series The Not Too Late Show with Elmo. Demand for Search Party also fell below the average TV during uh, TV a show during that period, but that may have to do with the fact that it's third, it's in, it's in its th third season and didn't debut for another month. I had never even heard of that show before. That doesn't that means anything. 
So they get into a few more details here. I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll brush through this because it's not Star Wars or related. They talk about Brave New World on Peacock, Curious George. Uh, the new entrants are still chasing Netflix, which is the market leader and nearly 193 million subscribers. Parrot data shows that Netflix originals and exclusive titles are significantly more in demand than ever um, than uh, every other streamer, including Hulu and Amazon's Prime Video. Rojas attributes some of Netflix's lead to the sheer volume of its content library, which is increasingly focused on original content and marquee exclusives as the major media companies pull back uh, the content on their own. As the streaming wars heats up and more outlets compete for uh, a person's attention, says Rojas. Uh, Let's see here. He continues, it goes beyond viewership in the traditional way of looking at the industry. It's all about capturing people's interest and connecting emotionally with people so that they see that show was a part of their life. All right. So the main point of that, and I probably didn't have to read most of that, was just the Mandalorian was the most in demand, far and outweighing, what, 55 times more, right, than any other show. So what does this all mean? It means much of what we've been talking about on the show for the past several episodes. The future of Star Wars 4 now is on TV. So what does that what does that really mean? Well, I'm, I'm going to lay out some some options and scenarios. This is pure and unadulterated speculation on your host John Justice's part here on a Star Wars podcast with my nerd world. So take it for what it's worth. These are just some thoughts that I happen to jot down. Let me start here. It was really the guys on the Echo Base podcast. Um, Their most recent episode was really, really enjoyable. Apart from some of the negativity towards The Last Jedi, which I still get annoyed by, um, it wouldn't bother me so much if people would just take a time to go, in my opinion. (laughs) Just in my opinion. I know it's probably and supposed to be a given, right, that it's in their opinion, but man, it just drives me nuts when people make blanket statements like, you know, Ryan Johnson didn't do a good job on The Last Jedi. In your opinion. Anyways, the guys on Echo Base talked about a Star Wars universe of films, playing out like Marvel, where we get a series of films set in a timeline that could culminate in large saga films like Avengers did, okay? And we've also heard that maybe Disney Plus is doing that. Okay, so reading some of the tea leaves, I just want to toss some of these things out. As I did my notes, I realized that a couple of the items of speculation don't necessarily line up, but I just like to kind of get the speculation rolling if you want to add anything please email me talkshownerd at gmail.com um you know jot down a note and let me know what you think and what perhaps you think the future is going to be on tv or or movies so here's a couple of scenarios reading the tea leaves we know that taika watiti is writing his own movie and there's been a lot of speculation that the the first of the films which is now going to come out in 2023 will be taika's movie okay So we'll get back to that in a moment. We also know that Kevin Feige of the Marvel Universe was announced for a movie. But he doesn't direct. He produces. Which I find interesting. Especially when you consider Taika Waititi and his ties to Marvel. Obviously working with Kevin Feige. His um, Thor movie. And he's already in the Star Wars universe with the fantastic job he did with The Mandalorian. I will not repeat my love for that for, for that final episode of The Mandalorian that Taika Waititi directed. So, what could this potentially mean? Well, there's a few options here, okay? Um, Disney Plus is its own thing, right? The stuff that happens on Disney Plus just happens on Disney Plus and that's it. Maybe they could be cultivating timelines and different and different shows so that they can interconnect we've talked about this quite a bit on the past few shows if we have an ahsoka show uh that ties into the mandalorian um i don't think you can do that right well you can't do that with obi-wan you can't do that with cassian andor right but you could in the timeline if we are supposed to be getting another solo movie or show like we talked about on last week's episode then you could certainly do cassian andor obi-wan and solo which may be where this is going. Our eyes are on Mandalorian and Ahsoka, but perhaps this is more, again, about that pre-A New Hope time period. And maybe the shows that we are getting in the post-Return of the Jedi could be used to foster films. Okay, so more on that in a second. All right, so first off, Disney Plus is doing its own thing. Or we could have Disney Plus is is the place where the one-off stories 
lead to major motion pictures that include the Disney Plus streaming show characters specifically. So, for example, Mandalorian, Ahsoka, in the timeline between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. I don't think that's very likely. Okay. What else could we be doing? Well, um, Disney launches a new slate of films with individual stories that lead to big saga movies. Now, the 2023, 25, and 27 doesn't really lend itself to that. That's too far apart. Marvel, the Marvel machine was, what, two Marvel movies, and then every handful of years we get a big Avengers film. So I think there's a possibility of, again, a couple of scenarios. And that could be, Disney Plus could be the clearinghouse, for lack of a better word, of individual series and shows that act like the Marvel spinoff films did, leading to big Avengers movies. I don't know if you heard that. In the, I actually had to pause the show. My 13-year-old son was at the door yelling my name, <laughs> so I had to go and talk to him. All right, so uh, as I was saying, you could have a circumstance where they're using the Disney Plus platform to build up those stories and characters, and then that leads to big uh, major motion pictures. Right, The guys on Echo Base had, had a really interesting idea and sort of scenario laid out where it plays out like Marvel does in that if you do have separate, separate spinoff films focusing on individual characters uh, and then they end up working into larger films where all those characters are included, then you get a little bit of something for everybody. And I thought it was a really good point when you look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe you know, not everybody is a fan of every single Marvel character, but they. But when you do the big Avengers films, you've got everybody in it, so everybody comes out for the party. Again, the problem that I see with Star Wars is that that would mean Disney Plus, I mean, that would mean Disney and Lucasfilm pumping out more films, which I don't see them doing because they got so scared over what happened with Solo. So the 2023, 25, and 27 doesn't really lend itself to that. Unless there are other movies planned that we haven't heard about or they're using Disney Plus as the place to showcase the individual movies that they then bring all those characters in for the big films. Again, just speculation. Comment if you like. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Okay, so where else does this take us? Well, what if the next series of films is centered in the High Republic era, which is where the publication arm has gone? Right now, uh, Lucasfilm, when Lucas and Disney are really focused on everything but movies right now, for the most part. We're supposed to get a High Republic video game. We've got comics. We've got novels in this High Republic era. Okay. The question that I have, though, is how do you get butts in the theaters without a big named character, if that was going to be the case? So under this scenario, Disney Plus would be doing its own thing and just doing its own thing. And the movies would be their own thing. I do believe the movies need to focus on one time period. High Republic seems like the obvious choice because they're, they're focusing on that when it comes to publications, right? Okay, but again, how do you get butts in theaters without a big name character? Well, what if you already had a big name character that's actually in that timeline? This brings me right back around to Taika Waititi's movie. What if it's a Yoda story set in the High Republic and produced by Kevin Feige? Yoda being directed, doing nothing with my fingers, um, by Taika Waititi, to me, makes all the sense in the world, especially when you consider that character and how whimsical he was and funny he was in The Empire Strikes Back. I could totally see Taika directing a film, and there could already be an established reference to Mandalorian with the child, right, who was born around the same time, or if not exactly the same time, as, as, as Anakin. If we get introduced, and I know the timelines don't match up because the High Republic takes place long before the Phantom Menace and the birth of Anakin Skywalker. Be that as it may, if we are going to be visiting the homeworld of the child and Yoda's species in The Mandalorian, then it would make a little bit of sense of the familiarity that people have with this highly in-demand and incredibly popular show 
where we go back in time and we get more history and we start building up saga and mythology within that High Republic area. Again, this is just fun speculation. And I firmly believe that in the next few weeks we're going to probably find out. Because I'm believing, I'm of the opinion that Disney and Lucasfilm wanted to drop a bunch of really cool information on Star Wars Celebration, which takes place in two weeks. I'm looking at my calendar right now because I'm taking that week off because I was supposed to be in California, but I'm staying home and doing a staycation in instead. All right, so welcome to your future of Star Wars. But again, as I keep hammering, it's got to be the right content and characters, along with meaty mythology that fosters intrigue and rampant speculation. That 2023 movie, in my opinion, needs to be huge, epic, and expansive. That's what movies are for. I look at Thor Ragnarok, which I love. That film is actually a lot bigger in scope than I really think about. Like, when I think Thor Ragnarok, that's an almost that movie is almost as long as The Last Jedi. It's about two hours and 20 minutes long. It feels like on its face, like an independent Thor movie, but really it's a pretty expansive and big film. So I think, and it's it's almost like it's riding a line between being an epic and being a personal story. And so I think Taika could, could really do a good job of taking that type of style and making a more personal story with an individual character like a Yoda or somebody else. Where you're kind of going into it thinking this is a smaller film, but really it's a lot more expansive than what you actually thought you were getting into. Like if somebody asked me, you know, is Thor Ragnarok an epic? I'd go, no, that'd be my first instinctive reaction. But when I think about it further, I think, yeah, you know what? I'm actually wrong about that. <laughs> it actually is a a pretty epic space opera and a really, really good one at at that. But again, what do you think? Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Drop me an email. We'll cover it hopefully on next week's uh, show. But I really would like to know what you think about that. What do you want? What do you think that's going to end up happening? Um, I would I would love to be privy to the behind the scenes of the story group and what Disney and Lucasfilm are 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 planning right now. Um, the, the, the pandemic gave them a really good opportunity to spend some time and flesh some of this out. And if you don't think that they're looking, and Kathleen Kennedy already said this, they were looking 10 years in advance. So let's speculate now and next week before we get some information, because I really do think that that week of the 24th through the 28th, we're going to end up getting some pretty big Star Wars news because Disney and Lucasfilm had always intended on releasing Star Wars. And we need some right now. So that, you know, the times are really really slow right now when it comes to Star Wars news. And I think the fandom is absolutely ready to uh, begin to start speculating on some good Star Wars news. And look, let's be honest. We really need that in the, in, in the, in the, you know, in the world right now. Um, now more than ever talk show nerd at gmail.com. Let me know what you think. And I'll talk about it on next week's show. Something inside me has always been there. But now it's awake. And I need help. So I just want to take a few minutes and I wanted to get past sort of the this is usually the kind of thing that I do at the start of the show. Uh, We do have just a couple of uh, listener feedbacks that I'll share with you in a moment. Um, Again, it's been a little slow on email too, but again, it's been slow news and um, there hasn't been a lot to talk about in terms of, uh, of Star Wars, which is another reason why I took last week off. Um, so I haven't, um, I've talked about this a little bit on the, um, on the, the show that I do Monday through Friday on Twin Cities News Talk here in, in, uh, in Minneapolis. And I decided, you know, for better or worse, I would talk about it on, on this show. Um, Star Wars is incredibly personal to me. Uh, for anybody who's listened to the show for any length of time, um, I've talked about this often, and that's you know when when it, when it comes to family, you know my you know my uh, my my walk with God, my faith, my Christianity, my family, my job, and then underneath that are all the things that I enjoy on uh, Star Wars and Depeche Mode and NASCAR. And Star Wars usually sits there at the top. Um, a part of that family aspect is uh, my uh, my dog, my dog Bella. Um, Bella is a, a brown lab mix that we rescued from a shelter uh, in um, probably August or September of, uh, of 2009. 
Um, that's significant from um, for, for me because it was early in that year that I had my heart attack when I was 37 years old. And um, it was discovered that I had an ascending aortic aneurysm and a bicuspid heart valve. I had two flaps instead of three. So I had to go through major open heart surgery to have a to have a graft replacement to replace that portion of my aorta attached to that valve. And I had to have a mechanical valve put in. Uh, in 2012, I had to go through a second open heart surgery because there was a leak in the graft. Um, we purchased Bella that first year of when I, when I dealt that year that I dealt with that first open heart surgery. Uh, and, you know, she's been our our beloved dog ever since. Um, she's 11 years old now. And I say all this um, because the reason why you're getting the show early this week is because tomorrow uh, we are going to <clears throat> I thought I was going to be able to get through it. Gosh, darn it. <clears throat> we're going to have to um, we're, we're going to have to say goodbye to her. And oh, shoot. So I um I didn't want to go two weeks without doing a show, and, um, you know, I had things I wanted to talk about, and I definitely didn't want to do it tomorrow, which is why you're getting the show a little bit early this week. Um, apart from my family, my wife and my two boys, um, she's been my best friend, and she's been there, uh, she's been my comfort dog more than anything. Uh, she's been by my side and and has always just been there to give her to give her love to me and in all of my most difficult moments of these past 11 years, which have been, you know, um, you know, portions of it have been some of the most difficult years that I've ever had, especially when it comes to the physical aspect of it. We moved up here to Minneapolis in 2016 and it was from, um, from Arizona and that was really difficult and took a toll on her. Uh, she, it, for, for the majority of the first leg, about eight to, I don't know, it was like almost 12 hours, I think. Um, we couldn't get her to lie down in the car. And, and since we got here, we've got a lot of stairs. We've got like four different levels in our, in our house. And most of the houses here in Minnesota are this way. Um, and it's just taken a toll on her. She's got, um, she's dealing with, um, some, with sciatica and arthritis in her legs. She's got some breathing issues and, um, it's just, it's time that we do the right thing for her and we say goodbye. Um, today's been a pretty good day with her um we've spent some time together and done the things that we do now she doesn't really have the energy she can only walk around so much before she has to go and, and sleep and lie down and when she is moving around i can tell she's in pain so um so yeah i i wanted to take a moment though and turn this towards star wars for a moment because the theme of loss has played such an important role in all of these films that it doesn't get talked about very much so i wanted to just take a few minutes and um this is and, and look, and I'll, I'll be straight up and honest. I mean, if if you're ready to t to tune this out, I totally can understand, and that's why I, um, apart from the few items that I have for listener feedback, that's why I kind of saved it for the latter part of the show because um, this is a little bit cathartic for me. I, I still have to go to work tomorrow, and um, this wonderful this wonderful group of people that are coming over tomorrow to to be with us and to handle to handle um, our saying goodbye to her. Uh, here in our home um, tomorrow afternoon. They've just been, they've been wonderful and I still have to go to work tomorrow and it's going to be a difficult day. And I thought, well, you know, um, I didn't want to necessarily get into this on my, on the, on the full-time job that I do. It's not just my show. It's the justice and drew show. And um, usually we do post-show podcasts and tomorrow we can't. So I thought, you know what, let me get it out of my system a little bit and talk about it on the show. And more specifically, how Star Wars has kind of helped me deal with deal with a little bit of this. So all I've done here is I've, I've jotted down some notes, somewhat chronological order. Um, forgive me, I'm sure I'm missing some other points in here. And so if there's anything that you want to add to this that we can talk about on next week's show, which should be interesting because <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to be like um, to, to say that, that Bella is it means – um, a lot to me is just an understatement. She's again, she's been my best friend. Um, and so this is an incredibly difficult time and I'm trying to hold it together and I can't even imagine what we're all going to be going through as a family tomorrow. Um, but the theme of loss in star Wars has played a key role. And one of the things that I've loved about the star Wars movies across the board is I am a b believer um, in God, and I am a believer that everything does happen for a reason and good storytelling lends itself to that type of, 
belief system, right? Things lead to other things. If you don't have certain things happen, then other things can't happen. And I love that within the Star Wars, Star Wars universe. And the one thing that keeps passing through my mind in the middle of going through the grieving process, knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, it's that moment when Anakin is dealing with the visions that he's been having of Padme to Yoda, you know, and Yoda, you know, point blank just says, you know, celebrate those that transform into the force, mourn them, do not miss them, do not. And there's some truth in that. Uh, I know that, you know, my beloved Bella is going to be at peace and she's in pain right now. And even though she's still so loyal and following me, like she knows she's following me around all day long today and we're having little special moments and it's been great. It's been absolutely great. Um, but I know she's going to be better off when it's done, even though we're all going to hurt, but she's provided so much joy that, um, you know, this is where I have to give back to her, but you go back to the Phantom Menace and Shami having to say goodbye to Anakin, right? Um, I've, I've always liked the prequels, but they've really just, as I've gotten older, I've just come to appreciate them more. Um, especially the storytelling. Uh, I'm again, as I've mentioned, I can look past some of the clunky acting and writing and all that and just really take them in for what they are. And, you know, it's gut wrenching thinking here's this mom who has this boy, the confusion surrounding the nature of that conception, right? And these individuals who just show up and she knows he's special. And now she has people who are telling them, telling her that she's special and she has to say goodbye because she knows it's the best thing for him. Anakin's fear of loss and of his mother and of Padme, the driving force in the prequels of what that does to Anakin that leads him to the dark side, but ultimately that redemption that takes place in Return of the Return of the Jedi, the fear of Padme's loss and ultimately her death at the end of Revenge of the of the Sith. Uh, it's just it's it's so incredibly tragic to the point where he doesn't even realize what he's done. And, you know, until he's become more machine um, than man at the end of that movie. And I know people don't like the no, but I dig it. It's very pulpy. It's very monster movie ish, but it's also anguish and pain. And, you know, I and again, it sounds weird to think about, but I know how emotional I've been since we had to make this decision with with Bella. And, you know, I, I get it. I understand it. I know these are movies, these are fiction, these are writing, these are George Lucas storytelling, but there's a reality to that, that that's what Anakin would be feeling in that moment, right? Um, I won't get deep into the Clone Wars, but the the arcs of Ahsoka within the Clone Wars and Rebels and Anakin and those last four episodes and her having to deal with Order 66 and what happens with those clone troopers. I mean, again, the theme of loss in Star Wars weighs heavily. And and I love it because these are the modern tales and the modern mythology. You know, our children these days aren't being raised on the mythology that George Lucas made these movies and reference these movies about right your bear your Beowulf your King Arthur those 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 Arthurian tales that George Lucas was inspired from and and the Joseph Campbell storytelling no now our children and us I mean even us I mean I'm familiar with some of those but it was Star Wars that taught us this and there are lessons to be learned through this you move over into Solo and while you've got loss in Solo right you've got the uh, you know, the deaths that take place in that movie. But to me, I, that Solo, Han Solo being ripped apart from Kira and that being the driving motivation for him. Um, and then her having to say goodbye to him at the end of the film. There was a genuine care and love that I believe that Kira had for Han to the point where in the beginning, she almost, I mean, she pretty much sacrificed herself. Han, go. She gave herself up and ends up getting swept up into Crimson Dawn. And at the end, she gives him up to save him. And then, of course, you get into Rogue One. I mean, that movie is nothing but death, <laughs> right? All those individuals fighting this battle, right, at the end, sacrifice themselves to save this idea, to save this dream, right? That's the driving factor and the crescendo of that movie. When you get into A New Hope, and this is where, as a kid, I really resonated star with Star Wars and what I was really drawn to. Because you get into A New Hope, 
Luke not having his father drove my interest in A New Hope. I was, I love my father, and I've always loved my father, and we've had our, our difficulties through uh, times in our lives, uh, but we've always come back again, and we've always been very close, and through the divorce and all of the different, you know, trials and tribulations that you go through growing up and as a, as a, as a son, um, as a parent, I could relate to Luke thinking, wow, I mean, as a five-year-old kid and then growing up six and seven and then looking at my father and thinking he's the greatest person in the world because he is. And then thinking about Luke Skywalker, not having his dad, you know, living with Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru, I was just like, wow, that must have been hard for him. I can imagine that, right? He wants to know about his his father. And then, of course, you get into The Empire Strikes Back, and then you find out that that's his dad, and it just it brings it to a whole other level. Losing Han in The Empire Strikes Back, and his, you know, his being taken, you know, by, uh, by, by, by Boba Fett. Uh, and, of course, you get into Return of the Jedi, Anakin's redemption, and then his death, right? At the end, Luke finally got to look upon his father with his own eyes he finally gets to, he finally got to look upon his dad in those final moments when his you know when vader goes and saves the day becomes anakin skywalker he gets redeemed and then of course he he passes passes away um again i don't think people recognize how much loss drives all of these films okay and then you get into um the sequel trilogy which i love solo's death resonates throughout the entire sequel trilogy it's the motivating thing. It doesn't get talked about enough. Maybe they could have been a little bit more on the nose with it, but if it wasn't for what happened between Kylo Ren and Solo, you don't get the journey, the rest of the journey that we get to go on in that film, in those films. You just don't, right? It weighs upon Kylo Ren in The Last Jedi. Snoke identifies it. He sees it when he tells him to take that silly mask off. Beautiful, amazing writing from Ryan Johnson, right? And and I, I I look at that that whole scenario, and and when when Kylo Ren raises up at the beginning of the film when he's pissed at Snoke, right? He's to the point where he destroys the mask, right? Something that he loves. This is his shield. This is his power. When he puts the mask on, like Kathleen Kennedy says in the behind the scenes stuff, it gives him his power. I'm and then and then he he goes to move against Snoke at the beginning because Snoke's just taunting him, calling him a child, saying he has too much of his father in him, that he's too devastated by, he, he cares too much about the fact that he killed his dad. And Kylo Ren wants to take him out, and and Snoke zaps him, right, throws him to the floor. At the end of the movie, when he has the opportunity, I just think back, oh man, Kylo Ren's just getting his revenge. He's taking it out on him, right. He's still he's still ticked off at how mad at how mad Snoke made him. And now he's going to stick it to him. But he's not redeemed yet. He still doesn't get it right. He still screws up and tries still continues to screw up and he does so even in the Rise of Skywalker. He still thinks that he can have his dark side and the girl too and it can't happen. No, cuz he can't do it as Kylo Ren. Cuz that's not truly who he is. And he ends up killing Snoke, tries to get the girl, and Ray's like, uh-uh, I'm not having it. So what does he do? He, re he reverts back even further. He goes and rebuilds the mask. And it wasn't until multiple viewings that I really started to appreciate that little scene of him rebuilding the mask. Yeah, I wish it was a little bit longer than it was supposed to be when they reforged the mask. But it still does the job that it's supposed to do. Kylo Ren is still ticked off. He still doesn't get it. And so what does he do? He's like, I'm going to build my mask. It's like, a, it's like a petulant child. A petulant, a petulant child. He, he goes and he, re, he I'm going to put my mask back on again. You got a problem with it? I mean, it's about what he does when he gets all ticked off when he's in front of the other First Order officers, right? And then Kylo Ren begins to see it. He begins to understand it later on. Okay, you get the passing of Leia. She gives herself up to give Rey that opportunity to bring Kylo Ren back. And then Kylo begins to see it. And then he sees that vision of Han Solo, right? It's a part of his memory. And he starts to understand. And that's when you get to the end of The Rise of Skywalker. And I just really feel like it's so beautiful. I love the way it plays out. All right, I'm looking forward to watching those films again. And I'm going to, after tomorrow, um, um, I am going to take that week off, that one week off. But um, I'm looking forward to watching it. But I also know it's going to be gut-wrenching. Um, I know we're talking about films and loss. I'm just an emotional person. 
And I, I just, I know me well enough to know that it's going to be really hard for me when I no longer have my, my, my best furry friend with me. And then when I watch those films, they're going to take on a whole different meaning for as crazy at that, as that sounds. But that's, you know, that's the part of Star Wars that's in my life. And I understand that, you know, everything happens for a reason. And so does this has to happen. But when you get to the end of The Rise of Skywalker and Rey, you know, you think that Kylo Ren gets yeeted, you know, into the pit and he's not coming back. And then Rey dies. Man, that's brutal. Finn feels it because he's tapped into the Force. But then, you know, but then what do we, you know, then what do we get? Kylo Ren rises from the ashes one last time. That whole moment when he returns, when you see the TIE fighter and you see, you see Ben Solo, not Kylo Ren, I'm sorry, Ben Solo returns. When you see Ben Solo and he turns to the camera and goes running in and leaps onto the, onto the chain and does that, uh, ouch, right? Just so fantastic. But then after, Ray is dead and Ben Solo rises up. And his return, that amazing, wonderful moment between the two of them, and then he sacrifices himself. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And 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 again, for me, what I'm dealing with right now personally in my life, uh, I'm not going to lie, and it sounds hokey, but it's going to be easier for me to deal with because of these stories that we've all been so blessed to be able to enjoy. It's probably at the heart of why I I hate all the negativity and why I just openly love these films, even for the flaws that they have. And I just cannot succumb to that negativity because they provided me with so much joy in storytelling. You know, I have my own faith and that's first and foremost. And it gets me through these difficult times and what I deal with. Don't misunderstand that. These are just movies, right? But these are also a gift that come from that same place. You know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And I'm not going to get all religious. I'm not. Everybody is entitled to believe whatever it is they want to believe. I'm just telling you what I do and the and the, and how Star Wars plays into it. I remember growing up as a kid and asking my dad about, you know, when I was going to church and learning about Christianity and and uh, secularism and all that. And and ultimately, you know, it's it's what you do with that content. You know, everything is a gift. Um, you know, and these movies have been a gift have been a gift for me. Uh, and, uh, they've, they've taught me a lot about that and, and they will may not be a huge part of my grieving process that I'm about to go through here and, you know, in about 30 hours or so, um, but they're going to play a role. They, they, they will. Uh, and this is why I love these stories because these stories are ultimately about family. And that's really probably where I should have started is these stories are a reflection of who we are. And that's why they resonate so well. They're a reflection of the family matters that we deal with and the loss that we deal with every single day. Life is hard. I don't have to tell you that, man. 2020 sucks. Life is hard. And George Lucas and J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson and Dave Filoni and Richard Marquand and Irving Kirshner and all the individuals, the Taika Waititi and all of them that have participated in writing these stories, they're all just pulling these stories in a galaxy far, far away from those things that we deal with every single day. And that's why Star Wars works. And to sort of put a bow on this, that's why moving forward, I believe it's so important that Disney and Lucasfilm continue to tap into that. Make sure you tell those family epic stories. Make sure you drive at the heart of the stuff that we deal with here, you know, as human beings on a day-to-day -day basis. Set it in a fun place, a galaxy far away. Give us amazing spaceships and lightsaber battles and really cute green frog-looking creatures and all of it. But tell us those stories because it's a reflection of what we are and what we have to deal with. And that's what makes it so relatable. Talkshownerd at gmail.com is the email address. I need someone to show me my place in all this. Just got a couple of emails this week, and the first one comes from a friend of the show, Brian Martin, who asked this. Why didn't Disney slash Lucasfilm use George Lucas's treatments for the sequel trilogy? I think you'd probably have to go and ask Disney and Lucasfilm. My guess is it wasn't what they wanted to do with the story. That's my guess. I think they used more than we are being told of what George Lucas wanted. I think George Lucas had really detailed treatments of what 7, 8, and 9 were going to be. And they cherry-picked what they wanted to use. But my guess is, you know, they, they didn't want to go that route. And we've heard from George Lucas himself specifically that he wanted to get more into, it sounded like, 
the you know the microbiological world and more into midi chlorians. And I think that Disney and Lucasfilm are probably afraid of doing that. You know, and 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 I mean, he teetered on that and played with it a little bit in the in the prequel trilogy. But I think Disney and Lucasfilm wanted to do their own thing. And I'll be honest, without knowing what George Lucas was going to do, I'm glad that they did what they did because I love those films. But thank you as always for the uh, question there, Brian. I appreciate it. J O B writes this: Solo was a great movie, but I think the weak link was Alden Ehrenreich. No offense to him, but he was missing something that made Harrison Ford Han Solo. Ehrenreich's portrayal wanted to do the right thing right off the bat. Ford's portrayal, although. Uh, wanted to do what was right. He did it begrudgingly, and that's just something an, an, an innate in a person. Also, I would have picked Anthony Ingruber because he looks just like Harrison Ford and also played him in The Age of Adeline. Um, I love Alden Ehrenreich, and thank you for the uh, for the email there, J-O-B, as always. Um, I really loved Alden Ehrenreich. Um, I wouldn't have won an Anthony, uh, Anthony Ingruber, even though I've seen him do Harrison Ford, and it is amazing. I wouldn't have wanted him doing that because it just would have been too much of looking at Anthony Ingruber not being um, Harrison Ford. And when I watch, when I watch Alden Ehrenreich, I just accept all Alden Ehrenreich being solo and not him trying to do solo. I want to make one more point, and I, I meant to do this a little bit later on in the show, but I do want to say this. And the guys on Echo Base were were the, were the ones that that. Um, that kind of sparked this thought in my head because they mentioned they mentioned it. The reason the Mandalorian did so well, and I said this before, but I wanted to state it again because we were talking about the future of the franchise and Star Wars, you know, the movies and the, and, and Disney Plus. Um, moving forward, uh, whether or not they do a Yoda movie or not, and you know, whether that that's true, I, I I I kind of hope Disney goes out on the limb and introduces all brand new characters and doesn't play in any of those existing worlds anymore because there's too many preconceived ideas and notions that comes with established characters. And I think that's why The Mandalorian works so well. Obi-Wan is loved and we're getting Ewan McGregor back as Obi-Wan. So I don't think there's any fear there. Cassian Andor was popular in Rogue One and we're getting... You know, Diego Luna back as Cassie and Andor, so I don't think there's going to be a problem there. I do think there is going to be controversy surrounding Ahsoka. I think you're going to see some fandom division when it comes to the live-action version of Ahsoka not meeting the expectations of the individuals that love the cartoon versions of that character. And I think Disney and Lucasfilm are going to find that out, but it's worth it to them, and I believe it's worth it to do it, even though you're going to get that controversy, but just expect that. Anytime that Disney and Lucasfilm introduce Star Wars content that is existing canon characters that we have grown to love, they are going to run the risk and will get blowback from a segment of the fandom. And the reason why they didn't for The Mandalorian is because he was not Boba Fett, so there was no preconceived ideas. If you had made The Mandalorian exactly the same way that it was and that it is and called him Boba Fett and not and not uh, Din Djarin, we'd have all kinds of problems. People would be pitching a fit. It's not the, man, not the Boba Fett that I thought. It was a masterstroke to make both um, IG-11, not IG-88, and The Mandalorian, Din Djarin, and not Boba Fett. And that's all that I have to say with regard to that. I do have one more thing before I want to let you go, and that is if you are newer to the show, I am an author, and I write science fiction stories. Right now, the Embark Trilogy is complete and available. For those that are not familiar with the Embark Trilogy, here's the breakdown. The greatest technological advancement ever made has gone missing, and Earth is at risk. The hunt is on to find the only hope for humanity's survival. Five friends have unwittingly found that hope. They just don't know it yet. It's a future where flight culture has replaced car culture. And Taft Guardia will fight with his friends to save humanity and the girl that he loves. It really is the story in Embark Book 1 of how humanity took to the stars to find new worlds to go and populate. In Book 2, Taft, Katha, and his friends... On a far-off planet, must unravel the mystery of a lethal new threat to their way of life, with a lot of uh, mysteries revealed and secrets revealed in Embark Book 2, Treasure in Darkness. And then Embark Book 3, The Vanishing War, the only way the Raider Alliance can stop a ruthless galactic dictator is with the truth. The question is, will humanity in a far-off galaxy believe them? If you go to mynerdworld.net, 
can get all the details on the stories, I am writing a daily blog now that you can go. Well, it's almost daily. I am writing a blog there every day that you can go and check out. There is Embark merchandise available. All of the podcasts are available there. There is um, concept artwork for the covers done by Tom Edwards, which is amazing. I love the art for the books. And, of course, all the details about how you can go and purchase the books. So here's the deal on what's coming up in the future. Right now, the fourth story, which is a spinoff story, based off an event that takes place in Embark Book 3, The Vanishing War, is currently being edited. Um, It is a solo adventure written in first person, not a solo Skywalker story. It's a personal adventure written in first person, almost a a comedy, and I can't wait to get it out to you guys. If you want more details... Go to MyNerdWorld.net and go to the artwork page. You can actually see the cover for it there. While that is being edited, I am already 30,000 words into book number four. I'm sorry, book number five. Book number five will kick off an all-new trilogy and will continue many years down the line the story from the events that take place not only in book four but also The Vanishing War, Treasure in Darkness, and book one. The ebooks right now are priced all three at $2.99. Purchase of the ebook gets you a big discount on the audiobooks. All three audiobooks are produced and narrated by me and are available right now, as are all the paperbacks. If you want to support My Nerd World and the My Nerd World podcast and a Star Wars podcast, the best way you can do that is by picking yourself up a copy of your preferred choice of the book and leaving a review. I need uh, reviews. I say it every time I do the show, and I mean it. Uh, Reviews help for future sales, and if you enjoyed the books, I would really appreciate it if you'd go to Amazon.com. If you've purchased the books already and haven't left a review, please go and leave just a short review telling me what you enjoyed about the books. It would mean the world to me. And if you haven't picked up the books, go get your copy or go and purchase one for a friend. There's a link right there on the homepage where you can go and gift an ebook or a paperback to a friend. And again, it's the way that you can go and support the the show. Thanks for... um, Thanks for listening if you hung out, and uh, I hope that uh, the the personal part of the podcast this week, um, uh, I, hope you, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, it's a little different, uh, and it was very personal for me. I just wanted to get it out of my system, and I wanted to use this platform because uh, Star Wars is personal to me. I feel like I've got a friendship with a lot of you who email me, even though I've never had the opportunity to meet you, and I really wanted to at Celebration. Um, but this is going to be a really difficult time here in the next, um, you know, like I said, the next 30 hours or so. And, um, I just appreciate you allowing me the opportunity on the star Wars podcast to, um, to get a little personal. I really do. Uh, and I, I hope you, I hope you don't mind. Uh, and thank you so much for downloading the show. All right. That's it. I hope wherever you are, you're safe and you're, and you're happy. Um, prayers for our family would always be appreciated. Um, I really would appreciate that. Uh, Like I said, it's going to be really, really difficult, and I don't want to talk about it because I'm going to start getting upset again. So um, have yourself a uh, a fantastic week. Stay safe. We'll be back next weekend with an all-new show, and I look forward to hearing from you, talkshownerd at gmail.com, between now and then. Bye. The Force will be with you always. My Nerd World.